Amen. Now, I, 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 I'm just going to cut to the chase here because we all know December 25th, there's an epic battle that's been going on for hundreds of years over this particular day of the year, December 25. Who does December 25 actually belong to? There's an epic battle that's been going on for a long time and the battle is between two names, two figures, two, two, two entities and you know exactly who I'm talking about. Number one is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, and the other one is who? Santa. There's an epic battle going on for December 25th. Who is going to win the battle? Now, I have an under good faith that I know is going to win this battle. It's going to be Jesus at the end of the day. But I've come across some evidence because I'm an evidence type of guy. I like to look into the evidence and the facts and so on. So I want to present to you this morning just a little bit of evidence, a few facts that maybe you do, maybe you don't know about the entrance of Santa into the world, into planet Earth. Now, here's a couple of facts, just things for you to consider. I, I, I don't want to destroy anyone's childhood here, so I preface by saying that this may have the potential to change the course of your life and maybe change your faith and your belief system. But I'm going to present it anyway because I believe we need to hear this. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put my glasses on first because I can't afford to get the evidence wrong. The weight of Santa's sleigh loaded with one single beanie baby for every kid on planet earth anyone seen a beanie baby they're about that big a little thing with means the weight of santa's sleigh with one beanie baby for every kid on planet earth would be 333,333 tons now that's how heavy that sleigh is that he's dragging around that's with one beanie baby per person how many of you know that most kids are getting more than a beanie baby these days they're getting xboxes and playstations all kinds of other wonderful things mobile phones television sets cars this is just a beanie baby. 333,333 tons. That's a lot of, uh, for one sleigh to carry. 333,333 tons. By the way, if Santa stops at every home only here in Australia and has one cookie, one cookie at every single home he goes to, Santa Claus will put on 1.5 billion calories in one night. That's 333,333 tons in the sleigh plus 1.5 billion calories. That's a big ask for anybody to carry a sleigh like that, yet that's what we believe Santa does. I ask you to think about the evidence. The number of reindeer required to pull a sleigh that weighs 333,333 tons, Your Honour, it would need 214,206 reindeer, plus Rudolph. 204,207 reindeer would be required to drag a sleigh 333,333 uh, tons without the 1.5 billion kilos that Santa's collected. So that's, I ask you, think about the evidence. Did Santa really come to planet Earth? To deliver his gifts in one night, Santa would have to make 822.6 visits per second, slaying it 3,000 times the speed of light. These are facts, Your Honour. These are not made up. These are facts. For Santa to get to every house, he'd have to make 822.6 visits per second. I ask you, do you believe this? And here's the clincher for me. At that speed, Santa and his reindeer would burst into flames instantaneously. There you have it, Your Honour. How could Santa actually have came to planet Earth if at that speed he would burst into flames instantaneously? Case closed as far as I'm concerned. Now on the other end of the ledger, here we are 2,000 and roughly 20 years later and we're still celebrating the birth of Jesus. You tell me, where's the evidence point you? I declare this morning that Santa wins the battle for December 25. Amen? Santa Claus gets the cheese for December 25. Santa Claus didn't come to earth, but Jesus Christ did. That's all the evidence that we need. As a matter of fact, we're singing these songs, we're buying presents, we're gathering together as families and so on, because whether you believe in Jesus being the Son of God or not, you're still partaking in a celebration of his birth, whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not. The world is right now gearing towards a celebration that revolves around a historical moment called the birth of Jesus Christ, whether they acknowledge it or not. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? You can't take the reality of Jesus out of human history. You can try to deny the miracles. You can try to deny the changed lives. You can say it's just fluke, it's just chance. You can try to deny a whole bunch of things. You can try to deny this and deny that, but you can't deny something when there's billions and billions of people that every 365 days we decide to celebrate his birthday. Same with Easter. 
Every 365 days we celebrate and we remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. People can say we're going to change it. You know, isn't it funny? People can take these dates and say we're going to change the meaning of it. You ever say, we'll change the meaning. You can change the meaning all you want. Historically, you'll still trace it back to something that happened and you can't change the moment that it started. You can give it a new name. You can call it this day, that day. You can call it whatever you want. But any common sense person with half a brain will go, it doesn't matter what you call it. It's like calling day, night, and night, day. You can flip the two around, but hey, no, day is when the sun comes up and night is when the, moon, you know, the sun goes down. It doesn't matter what you say. You can't change that. You can't change that. The big news for humanity, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, 22 and 23 says this. Speaking of the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth and so on, how many of you know that, 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 that God came to Mary? And the Bible, these ancient writings tell us that the Holy Spirit moved upon this, this young girl, 14, 15 years of age she was at the time, and, and, and she fell pregnant. And then she had to break the news to her, her um, husband-to-be, her fiancé. And she went and told him. And it's, what's amazing is that in that culture, your first thought would be adultery. This woman must have played up because no one falls pregnant. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ingredient. There's something that happens when a person falls pregnant. And here's Mary, the first person in human history. And you expect me to believe that God did this? Seriously, you expect me to believe it was God? But instead of taking up the law and stoning this woman to death, which, is, which was the penalty for adultery back in that time, he could have easily said, you're an adulterous woman, we'll stone you to death, and would have been right within the law. But isn't it amazing that the very father of Jesus extended grace so that the king of grace could come into the world? And instead he said, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to put a, I'm going to break off our, our engagement, but we'll do it quietly because I don't want to bring shame to her and I certainly don't want everybody to make a big fanfare about it and find out why because they'll probably take matters into their own hands and stone this woman. And, and, and so uh, then, jo then, then Joseph goes to bed, he goes to sleep, and, and an angel appears to him, and this angel comes and assures him, he says, no, 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 you need to follow through with this. This, this child is, is, is born of God. You're going to become the stepfather to, to Jesus. And in Matthew, 20, Matthew chapter 1, 22 and 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Think about that for a second. I want you to, to not just sit here and read, uh, and, and a son will come and his name will be Emmanuel, which means God's with us. I want you to imagine what it must have felt like to be a member of a nation who, who, who were a nation loved by God, that God had an a, a individual relationship with the nation of Israel. The last time that this nation heard anything from God or had a major experience with God was just over 400 years earlier. For 400 years, there's been relative silence. They haven't heard from God. They haven't seen signs of God's existence. They haven't seen the hand of God and his favour upon them. By the time Jesus comes, these guys are, are certainly way down on the pecking order. The Roman civilization is ruling. Uh, these guys are servants and slaves. They don't have much say. They don't have much power. They're nothing. For 400 years. How many, of you, how many of you sitting in this room, you feel like God is distant from you? You feel like you haven't heard from him for a week, a month, maybe even a year. Imagine 400 years. There would have been generations of people that had zero contact. Zero tangible encounters with God during this time. Now you be those people and you imagine an angel appearing to you and the angel speaks these words, God with us. After 400 years of nothing, the announcement that this angel made was this, that God is now with you. God is now with you. The gift that we celebrate at Christmas time, the gift that we celebrate in the birth of Jesus was in very essence the gift of God's presence given back to humanity. Think about that. It's the gift of God's presence. Now when I say God is with you, when I say the presence of God is with you, there'll be two trains of thought. There'll be people sitting here and some of you are going to go, um, yes, I, I believe that by faith. I believe by faith that God is here. I don't have a goose bump. I don't have a, uh, anything happening. I don't feel anything. But you know, I just believe by faith because the Apostle Paul wrote that those who are justified, those who are made right by God, those types of people live by faith. In other words, God said stuff. God tells us things. We believe that stuff. We don't sit back and wait for experiences and then believe on the back of experiences. We just believe by faith. 
And what I've found in my life is when I take God at his word and I believe that on the back of that faith, then I have experiences and encounters. But if I sit back waiting for experiences and encounters to believe, I'm basically saying I don't want to live by faith. I still want to live by feelings. Because I want you to do something I can feel and then I'll believe it. Well, I'm still living by feelings, whether it's tagged under the name of God or not. And so, so there'll be two types of people here. Someone will sit here and go, yeah, I just believe by faith. There'll be other people who'll be sitting here this morning and you'll be saying, well, I don't actually, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe God is with me right now because I don't have a goosebump, because I didn't hear a voice, because I feel flat, because I feel disappointed, because this didn't work out for me, because that didn't happen. But the promise of Christmas is this, Emmanuel, I want to declare to you this morning and tell you that God is with you. God is with you right now. The presence of God is with you right now. I want you to just do me a favour, just for 10 seconds, entertain me. Close your eyes for a second. Close your eyes and just, I just want you to think about this thought. Forget what's going on in the room around you. Forget the person next to you. Just say that to yourself. God is with me. The presence of God right now in this room is with you. The one that said, let there be, is with you. This baby that we sung about, well, when, when Jesus grew up and Jesus left, before he went, he said to his disciples, he says, I will not leave you as orphans. He said, when I go, in fact, it's imperative that I go because I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. I'm going to continue to be with you. It's not just God is with you when this baby is born, but from that point on in human history, the declaration from heaven was that God will now continuously be with you until his return. God is with you right now. I don't know what you're going through in your world. I don't know what you faced this week, but I want to tell you this. God is with you. The presence of God is with you. And that is the gift of Christmas. How many of you have been running around madly like a chook without a head trying to buy presents and gifts and so on? Anyone been doing that? And you're probably going to on the 24th. If anything like me, I feel guilty every Christmas. So at 6 p.m. on the 24th, I'll drive to Alaska to find a shop that's open so I can buy a couple of extra things because I never feel like I've got enough yeah? Anyone like that or is that just me? Yeah, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for your honesty. rest of you, I pray for you. <laughs> Truth shall be revealed. God knows. Um, but we're running around trying to get gifts and presents because we want to give gifts to people. Yet the, the, the gift of God, the thing we celebrate at Christmas is that the gift of God to us is his very presence. It's the very presence of God. You know what? I think 99.99% of the church, we don't comprehend or understand that. We don't understand the power of God's presence. We don't understand how our lives could be changed if we lived every day, every moment with an absolute faith in the fact that God is with me, present right now. How many problems do you have in your life that could be solved by this one thing if you understood every moment of every day God's presence is with you? When you're sitting with that lady having a coffee and you just got that little piece of goss. Anyone know what I'm talking about? That little piece of juicy info. And, I, and I, what's the good in keeping that great bit of information to myself? Nobody knows I've got it. I've got to tell somebody. Did you know that such and such... I'm just telling you so you can pray for them. <laughs> now I want you to have that same scenario. You're sitting down having coffee in that situation, but Jesus himself is sitting there in a chair with you. All of a sudden. I, I, I read a story a few years ago about a guy, and he was at a bar. And uh, he rocked up at this bar, and he thought he'd chat up some girls at the bar, which, which those types of guys do. And uh, any guy here ever do that before you came to faith? No? Any guy do it since? No? Okay. Um, so anyway, this guy's at a bar and he, he's sitting at the bar and he sees this girl there and he goes over and he starts chatting up this girl. And this girl's just, she's really not that interested, but he's a guy, so he doesn't get it. Okay, because guys don't get that stuff. We, you know, she, she, she's sort of not showing him many signs, but that lack of signs is a massive sign for him. You know, so he's just, he's pressing in there. I mean, give it to him. He's pressing in. He's showing faith. He's having a crack. He's going. And he just won't back up. And he'll say, I, I can't help myself. I, I have to, you know, it's the way I'm wired and so on. And then about five minutes into the conversation, the toilet door opens up and out walks this guy built like a big brick toilet, covered in tattoos, shaven head, and he walks over towards the girl and he sits down. Turns out to be her boyfriend. All of a sudden, he finds within him the power and the ability to stop talking to her, to back away and leave the scene. Isn't it amazing how the presence of somebody can change everything? The presence of God in our lives can change so much about our lives. You're sitting there at night time in front of the computer. You know you shouldn't click that button. You know you shouldn't look at that thing. But nobody's there. So what does it really matter? What if somebody was there? What if you realised Jesus was sitting in a chair next to you? How much strength would that give you? How different would the next decision be if God was really with you? How much courage 
could you find to say what needs to be said if you knew Jesus was with you? How much strength could you find to resist temptation and say no to what you should say no to if you knew and truly believed the presence of Almighty God was with you? The story of Christmas, the declaration of Christmas, is you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. God with us. I want you to understand this morning, that's what we're celebrating, the gift of heaven. The gift that God gave to us, the greatest gift he could think of giving us, was his presence. You know, how many of us have been taught to believe that, that Jesus came to deal with sin, that the motivation of God, some of us think this way, some of us think that, that God's primary motivation and focal point was sin. And so Jesus' entry into the world was simply because God's focused on sin. So Jesus came to deal with sin. Sin is the thing that is in God's vision that's all he's focused on is your sin. Yet John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world, not that God so hated sin. God so loved the world that he gave this great gift of his presence to us because he loved the world. See, God deals with sin for one reason only, because he has to deal with sin in order to have relationship. But sin was not the focal point. It's not the point. Relationship is the point. God's presence with us is the point. Do you think God just wanted to come down to deal with sin? You're missing the gospel story. This story is good news. What's good about God just came to deal with an issue in my life? He didn't care about me, just wants to deal with an issue. He wants to deal with the issue because if that issue is stopping me having a relationship with him, then he wants to deal with the issue, not because the issue is the issue, the issue is relationship. Because God is with us. God is with us. God is here with us right now. My dad, some of you have heard this story, but I'm going to say it again. My dad, I love my dad. And my dad, when I was a kid, my favourite memory of being a child, and, and this, don't feel sorry for me, I'm, now that I'm about to say it, I've just said my favourite memory, I'm going, oh really? Anyway, this is one of my favourite memories of being a child. My dad would put me in the car and take me to the rubbish tip. And when we would go to the rubbish tip, my, he's still the same. If you went to my dad's house in Ballina right now, my dad has in his backyard two sheds. Both of the sheds have been built by stuff he's collected from the rubbish tip so that he could build sheds to put in the sheds built by stuff he collected from the rubbish tip to put things in he collected from the rubbish tip. And so it goes and so it goes. When I was a kid, he used to take me to the rubbish tip back when you didn't have to pay. Oh, boy, it bugs me today that you've got to pay to dump your rubbish. Huh? I get it. I'm not whinging about it. If anyone from council is watching, thank you. But... You never used to have to. So we would go to the rubbish tip, me and my dad, and we would, would, would scrounge around. And he would find things and he would grab them. He would put them in the back where this Kingswood station wagon. I remember one day that he found a rocking chair, a rocking horse, and he put it in the back of the, the Kingswood station wagon. And here I am sitting on the rocking horse like this unrestrained as we're going 120 k's down a dirt road. <laughs> but it's a great memory. You can't do that anymore, kids. I'm sorry because we're all too worried you might get hurt. And if you get hurt, then you won't recover and your world will be altered and so on. Don't get me started on that. That's a message for another day. Anyway, my dad would go to the tip and here's what he would do. He would go to the tip and he would scrounge around. He would grab stuff. He would bring it home. And then he would go to his shed and he would get out a little toothbrush and some petrol and he would clean it up. Get the mud off get a little bit of sandpaper and maybe get rid of the surface rust and stuff like that. And, 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 and then what he would do is he would, he, would, he would clean things up and he'd have a bit here and a bit there and a bit there and he would take the bits and he would put the bits back together. And he might have two toasters. And so what he'd do is pull it apart and find out, well, that's a problem in this one, but that, one's, that part's good, so I'll take that out and I'll put it back in. So what my dad would do is he would go down to the tip and he would see what somebody thought was absolute rubbish and they threw it away to dad. Dad would see the gold in it. Dad would see the, the future potential of that piece of rubbish. And my dad would grab that stuff and he would put it together meticulously, just work on it. And he would turn that piece of rubbish into something of great value and great use. He would, he would, he would turn what somebody else thought had no value. He would see the value and he would work at it and he would bring it back to life. That's God. That's God. Some of us, before we came to him, I'll tell you what I felt like. I was one of those pieces of rubbish in that rubbish dump. That's what I felt like. That's not what people would have thought that I felt, but that's what I felt deep down on the inside of me. I was empty, depressed, and hopeless. Laughing all day, every day, playing sport, going out with my mates, looking like it's all fine and dandy, but at night time when I laid down by myself, hopelessness, depression, sadness, and I couldn't understand it. 
couldn't understand it. How can I be so sad? I've got all these things. You know what I've learned in life? You can have everything but not have God's presence and you've got nothing. But you can have nothing but have God's presence and you've got everything. You've got everything. If God be for me, then who can be against me? If God is with me in whatever moment I'm going through, I don't care about the outcome because I'm going through it with him anyway. Like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego going into that five. I know that story in the Old Testament in the Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, chucks these three guys into a fiery furnace and, and, the, and the guys that are taking them towards the furnace, they just burn to a cinder and die before they even get close enough. That's how hot it is. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they made this thing. They said, here's the deal. We, we've got one God that we worship, that we believe in and we're going to worship him and bow to him and him alone and believe in him alone. We're going to go into the fiery furnace if that's where you're going to take us. But our God will save us, but even if he doesn't. And we've got that wonderful song we sing now. There's another in the fire. I, I, once upon a time I would have sung that for you, but not now that Daniel's cracking it. No. I'm not going to embarrass myself. God's presence changes everything. For God so loved the world, not God so hated sin. God, God's, God's, God deals with sin because sin keeps us separated from him. But his heart, his focal point is you. He wants relationship with you. He wants relationship with me. You know, it says when Jesus came, how many of you know that when Jesus was born, he wasn't born to the church? He came into a world where there was no church. He came into a world and he walked amongst people. Walked amongst people. And he loved people that didn't love him back. He served people that didn't serve him. He cared for people that didn't care for him. Jesus came to the world, to everybody. Whether you, whether you agreed with his philosophies, whether you agreed with the way he thought or not, Jesus came into this world for everybody. You're sitting here this morning. I don't know everybody here. Maybe you agree with Jesus. You're following him. Let me tell you something. He loves you. You're like that piece of rubbish at one point. He picked you up and he's working on you and he's turning you into a classic work of art. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't care about God, you're not that interested in him. That's okay, I want to tell you that he's just as interested in you and he's working on you and he's, 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 he's picked you up and he's wanting to do the same thing with you. He's wanting to do the same thing with you because you are just as special and just as precious to the heart of the Father. Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. How exciting is that? Imagine how different your life could be if you leave here this morning. You know, I used to work with this guy, and he used to get on my nerves big time. American guy. Anyone, any Americans here? Any Americans watching? I love Americans, by the way. I've learned to love them. But when I first met Americans, I just couldn't stand how, what I would have termed arrogant they were. But I learned, it's not arrogance, it's confidence. Because from the time they're born, every one of them are told, you could be the next president of the United States. You know? Well, that is reality these days. Yeah, he could be. <laughs> but anyway, there was this American guy, and I, I used to, I was running a school called a School of Evangelism, and he was one of our staff members. And we'd sit down to staff meetings or whatever, or we'd be whatever, and he would just constantly say under his breath, um, oh, what was it he used to say? He used to say, um, oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'd be, he'd be getting a cup of coffee, and you'd see him go, oh, thank you, Jesus. He'd be sitting at his computer typing away, and every now and then, Thank you, Jesus. And I used to think, what are you thanking him for? What are you thanking him? Like, seriously, what are you thanking him for? You're making a cup of coffee. Look, I'm grateful for coffee, but you know, it doesn't set my world on fire that much. He'd be typing away. He'd be, he'd be walking to the tool shed to get a tool. I swear he'd be sitting on the toilet. <gasps> oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, it didn't matter where he was, he'd be thanking Jesus. And it used to bug the life out of me. You know, it's only been in the last five years where I realised what he was doing. What he was doing was acknowledging no matter where he was, what he was doing, the presence of God was with him and he would just constantly say, speak out verbally, thank you, Jesus, as a way of reminding himself right now in this moment, God is with me. Emmanuel, God is with me. So now you know what I do? I do it now. I've become the crazy guy. You won't see me do it because I'm not that crazy. You're not as crazy as him. He did in front of everyone. I make you Jesus. I gave it a little bit to myself. But all he was doing was acknowledging God with us. If we really believed it, how different could your life be today? How different could your life be this week if you walked out of here this morning and you just believed by faith? Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Now, does that settle it or not? 
You see, the, the story of Christmas, when this child come, Emmanuel was the declaration. What's the big gift? What's the point? Yes, he's going to deal with sin. Yes, he's going to raise the dead. Yes, he's going to open blinded eyes. Yes, he's going to preach the truth. Yes, he's going to cast out demons. Yes, he's going to do all those things. Yes, he's going to die on the cross for our sins. But even when his physical body leaves, the moment of Jesus' birth was the beginning of an age. As a matter of fact, when Jesus stood up, his first time he ever stood up to preach, Luke chapter 4, it says he took the, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he opened it up and he started to speak. And he, he says, uh, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight of the blind. He goes on, he lists all this stuff. And then he says, in the acceptable year of the Lord, and then he finishes. But if you go back to Isaiah 61 and you read that, he stops mid-sentence. Because the very next one, it says, the acceptable, year, the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. But he stopped short there. Because we're not in the day of vengeance of our God right now. We're in the acceptable year of the Lord. We're in that time where God's presence is here and available to us, no matter what we're going through, no matter what we're facing. The presence of God is here for you. The presence of God is here. Let me just give you a couple of quick scriptures uh, about the presence of God. Psalm 16, 11 says this. It says, you will fill me with joy in your presence. Who doesn't want joy? You know where joy is found? Joy is not found in the next thing you buy. Joy is found in the presence of God. Why is joy not found in the next thing you buy? Because it's going to eventually rust. What might be the newest brand of Nike shoes? By the way, I only found that out the other day. I'm really... I haven't even got them on. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. I've got the wrong shoes on. But I've got a pair of white shoes, Nikes, and apparently they're the bee's knees. Someone told me a young guy the other day, oh, they're the cool ones, man. That's what all the kids are wearing these days. And I thought, flip, I just saw white shoes and bought them. But anyway, apparently I'm really cool. But you know what? Those white shoes aren't going to stay white for long. They're going to get dirty. And guess what? There's probably already a new radical trendy pair of shoes, and I'm probably outdated. The car you've got, there's probably going to be a better one. The house you live in now, it's all exciting when you first buy it. But after a year, two, three, five years, you want another house. Unfortunately, we live in a time today where you get married to someone and after when you've had enough of them, we feel like we can flick them and grab another one. It's a throwaway society. Grab something else. The grass is always greener on the other side, but the grass won't give you joy. Joy comes from the presence of God. You want real, true joy. Root yourself in this thought. Emmanuel, God with us. And you'll have a joy that nobody can ever take away, no matter what you're going through. Because joy comes from being aware, living daily with the knowledge of the presence of God. Amen? The presence of God brings us joy. Psalm 16, 11. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Who wants help when they're in trouble? Well, God is an ever-present help in trouble. In other words, His presence is there when you're in trouble. How many Christians get into an uncomfortable spot where we're in trouble or something doesn't feel good? And we assume that's evidence for God's absence. Yet it's saying here that that's evidence of God's presence because He's an ever-present help in time of trouble. So if you're here right now and you've got trouble going on in your world, according to these ancient documents and those that knew, God is with you because he's an ever-present help. He's there. Who doesn't need help in time of trouble? Help comes where? It comes from the ever-present presence of God. It's the presence of God. It's Emmanuel, God with us. It's the Christmas message. And you know what? God is with my unsaved friends and family. They just don't know it yet. But God's at work in their world because He's here and He's doing things. He's wooing them. He's calling them. He's drawing them to Himself. He didn't begin to work in your life when you said, yes, Jesus. You wouldn't have said, yes, Jesus, if He wasn't at work. God with us. This is the story of Christmas. This is the exciting message that the angel brought down. God is with us. God is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Hebrews 13 verse 5, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Who doesn't want contentment in their life? Contentment comes from where? The presence of God. He says you can be content. How can you be content? How can you keep your world free from the love of money? Nothing wrong with having money. Nothing wrong with earning money. Nothing wrong with wanting more money than you've got. Nothing wrong with that. But that place of inner peace and contentment. I don't care how much money you've got. You're not going to get it. 
because you're always going to want more. Why? Because you weren't created to find contentment in things. We don't find contentment in presents. We find contentment in presents. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> hey? That was pretty good. There's presents, which you'll give at Christmas, but then there's presents, which is you. I remember when my wife turned 40 a year ago. How many of, how many of you have, 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 have a wife that's turned 40 at some point? Anyone here? Got a wife turns 40? Yeah. Next question. How many of you, when your wife turned 40, sent her to Europe for five weeks? I win. When she turned 40, she went with a friend over to Europe for five weeks. I'm going... I'm going somewhere for five weeks too. I just haven't decided when or where. But um, five weeks over to Europe. And, and, and I remember when she came home, because there was a bit of a build-up to it. And I was, you know, I was missing my wife, because she's my wife, and I love my wife. And I was missing her. But I remember when she, when she got off the plane, and, and I drove up to Brisbane and uh, left the kids at home. And we just had one night together to catch up and stuff. And um, uh, I remember uh, picking... Yeah, that sounds real bad, doesn't it? That's, <laughs> thankfully, they're in kids' church. I didn't mean it that way. Oh, they're not, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyway, we came straight home. We picked her up and came straight home. But on the way home, we stopped to have a chat. And, um, but you know what I remember about that time was, was she, bought, she bought me presents. She bought me this beautiful leather jacket, Italian leather jacket that I'm, 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 I can't wear these days, but I'm, I'm getting back to that same body I had back then. But anyway, she bought me this beautiful Italian leather jacket. She bought one for, the, for, the, for the, all the boys and stuff like that. And I remember when she handed us the presents. But you know what? It wasn't, it wasn't the presents. It wasn't the gifts that I was so excited about. It was wonderful to get that jacket. I love that jacket. It's one of my favourite jackets. It was great to get that. But really, it was her presence. It was when she came into my world, when she got off that plane and I saw her and I was able to be with her. That was the real thing. That was worth... Yeah, he's going, come on, preacher, honey. That was the... Why didn't you start with that? You could have kept going. That's really what it was about. It was really the joy was found, the peace was found, the contentment was found in the presence of her. The presents were just bonuses. But I didn't hang my hat on any of the presents. Like I said, that jacket that fitted me perfectly back then. Eh. But the presents. Presents. Presents changes everything. My wife will tell you. When I used to travel and, and, and have to go away for, for different things and stuff like that, she would always say to me when I came home, she slept better. I'd say, why? She said, there's just something about having your presence in the house that makes me relax. There's something about just knowing you're here. You don't have to be giving me anything, don't have to be saying anything, don't have to be doing anything for me, just knowing that you're here. It's the power of presence. And the message on Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. God with you. The gift of God's presence in your world right now. I hope you're getting it. I hope you're understanding what, what, what this message meant to those first hearers. 400 years not hearing from God, not experiencing God, not even thinking God is there. And all of a sudden, the first thing that this angel comes and says to, to the world, here, you're going to name him Emmanuel. He's going to be called Emmanuel. Why? Because Emmanuel means God with us. I want you to understand. You may have felt like he's been absent for a long time, but I'm here to tell you right now, this moment in human history, something's happening and God is entering humanity to be with you. He's not a distant God up there. We cry, we, people talk about crying out to God like he's a thousand miles away. He's right here. He hears your whisper. He hears your whisper. You know, if you're going to listen to somebody whisper, you've got to be really close. If I want to hear Owen whisper, I've got to be really, really close. God hears you when you whisper. He's that close to you. His ear is that attuned to you. He's that for you. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It's one of my favourite passages in the book of Acts. Peter's preaching to this massive crowd of people. And he's giving it to them. He's not holding back. He's telling them about Jesus and you crucified him and all this stuff. And then he makes this statement. He says, repent. In other words, turn away from the way you're living. See, re repentance is not a prayer. Let me just say that. Repentance is not a prayer. It's a lifestyle choice. The church has turned repentance into a prayer. What we say is repentance. You can pray things and not, not change your life and not do anything about it. That's not repentance. That's just a word. Repentance in its original form is an action before it's a word. 
So he's saying to them, repent. In other words, he's saying, you don't have to make a big hoo-ha about it. What you need to do is just stop walking this way and do a 180 and start walking this way. That's repentance. Change your mind. Change your direction. That's repentance. If you happen to pray a prayer when you do it, wonderful. Even if you didn't say a word, God's looking at the actions. He sees when our heart repents and we turn and we walk away. And Peter says this, he says, repent then and turn to God. In other words, turn away from that and turn to God. Reposition yourself so that your sins may be wiped out. I love this second bit. And that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Who doesn't need times of refreshing? 2020 has been a tough year. I need times of refreshing. I'm going through stuff in my life right now. And I love the way he words it. He says, so that times of refreshing, not one time, it's plural. He doesn't say, turn, repent, so that the minute at your salvation you can have a moment of refreshment and then suck it up, princess, one day you're going to die and be with Jesus. He says, no, 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 so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of God. Times of refreshing. You know what that word refreshing means? It's interesting. I love it. That, that Greek word means this. It means a cooling a refreshing, a recovery of breath. You ever get puffed, burned out, tired? You need your breath back? That's what he's talking about. Times of refreshing. How do you get that refreshment? You get it from stopping and acknowledging and being in the presence of God. God wants to give you times of refreshment. God wants to give you moments where you can catch your breath again. I need to catch my breath. Anybody else here? Is it just me? I need to catch my breath. What we need to do to fully experience that presence is we need to engage with God. I had an uncle some years back, Uncle Bill. Loved my uncle, he's a great guy. I remember one year as a little kid going off to a family gathering and Uncle Bill rocks up in his car. We had our Christmas day, everyone gets their presents under the tree. Uncle Bill got given a whole ton of presents, you know. Uncle Bill, at the end of that weekend, when everybody went home, I remember walking with Uncle Bill down to his car. He went down to his car and he went to put his bag, suitcase in his car. And as he popped the boot and put the bag in, he had a car that was a yellow, um, yellow Corona. He used to call it the Yellow Canary ugly car but anyway he went down there and he put his bag in the boot and when he put his bag in the boot I noticed the boot was full of presents all the presents that he got given that Christmas he didn't even unwrap them he just put them in the boot of his car he drove off 12 months later 12 months later I'm pretty sure it was a year later we were meeting somewhere for Christmas or, or it might not have been Christmas actually it might have been something else but it was about a year maybe a bit over that later Uncle Bill was coming to some place where I was. The yellow canary is coming down the road. I'm excited because I, I enjoy spending time with Uncle Bill. The car pulls up. I go, to the, go there. He pops the boot to get his bag out. And guess what? All of those presents were still in the boot unwrapped. As a young kid, I was flabbergasted. that I couldn't understand it. How can you have a gift and not at least unwrap it and check it out? How can you at least not be curious and have a look? You know, maybe there are people in this room and you've heard the Jesus story, you've heard about this great gift that God has given to us, but you just haven't taken any time to unwrap it and to actually have a look at it. Can I encourage you today, if that's you, would you at least this Christmas consider getting a copy of these ancient documents? Would you at least consider asking the question, would you at least consider the evidence and the stuff that's out there about the existence of God? You say, what I've found with God, God, the story of Jesus answers the three most fundamental questions that every human being asks. Where do I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? All those answers are found in the person of Jesus Christ. All those answers are found in the very presence of God. And maybe you have accepted Jesus in this place. I've got a thought for you. When I was a little kid, there was this bowling game. Anyone, anyone ever remember? Maybe, maybe you don't, but there was this little 10-pin bowling game and you, a guy would pull his hand back like that and you'd press a button and this hand would go... Yeah, anyone remember that game? And, it would, and the ball would go down and knock the pins over. Anyone ever remember that? It was a big sucker. It was like, well, to a kid my age, I felt like it was from me to Owen when I was a little kid, but maybe it was only like that big, I don't know. But it felt like it was huge. And I wanted this present so badly. And I remember I must have bugged and bugged and bugged because I don't remember many Christmas gifts I ever really got, but I remember that one. And here's what I did. Uh, Mum and Dad were together at that point, so I was very young. But I remember going upstairs to their bedroom and I remember when they weren't home going through the cupboards trying to find the presents and I found it. So what I would do is when they would go out, don't you dare do this, by the way. <laughs> None of you kids should do this. It's terrible. Back in those days, the laws were different. 
kids could do it without going to jail. And um, so anyway, so when mum and dad would leave the house, you know what I would do? I would go up, I would grab the thing out, I would get it out of its box, and I would play with it. Here, mum and dad coming home in the box, back in the cupboard. Bang! We lived in this this place where the bedroom was very far away from the front door, so I knew when they were coming. And then they'd go away the next day. I'd be upstairs out. <laughs> mum and dad must have been so confused because by the time Christmas Day came and I unwrapped that thing, I just went, "Oh, thanks," and moved on to the next present. And yet here I was jumping out of my skin for this thing. By the time I got it, it was second hand. I'd played that thing stupid. I probably didn't play it again after Christmas. I just was bored of it because I had this thing and I just got used to it. I just got used to it. And, and I wonder maybe here this morning, for those of you that do know Jesus, those of you that have given your lives over to him, can I encourage you, you know, when it comes to the presence of God, I think we can be a little bit like that. We can just get so used to this thing that we've got. We can get so familiar with the toy that all of a sudden we'll wake up one day and we've lost the awe and the wonder of that wonderful gift of Jesus Christ that God gave to us. Can I encourage you this Christmas when you're unwrapping your presents and so on, would you think a little bit about that wonderful, wonderful gift that has been given to you? Not just the gift of a baby born in a manger, but the gift of the very presence of God himself available to you in times of trouble when you need peace, when you need answers when you have problems, when you need to catch your breath. It's the presence of God. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the birth of Jesus, God. And Father, we thank you for uh, that child that was born 2,000 years ago. But God, more importantly, I want to thank you for the, the engagement of your presence with every person down here on planet Earth. God, thank you for your presence in my life, God, that you led me to you, that you, you did things, you drew me to yourself. And when I received you, God, you came in and you changed my life. And Father, for each person here that has received you, Lord, I, I thank you for them. I thank you for their stories, their testimonies, Lord. For those in this room that are still trying to work it out, Lord, I pray, God, would you, would you draw them into the right directions, take them to the right places, help them have the right conversations. God, help them see the right things so they too can experience the joy of not just knowing by faith, not just knowing that your presence is out there because somebody told me, but actually engaging with that presence themselves and experiencing life down here the way you created us to have it, Father. We're meant to live it with you, not apart from you, God. We're meant to live it walking side by side with you, not on our own. So, Father, I pray for each person in this room. I pray a blessing upon them, Lord God. I pray for great times over Christmas, great times of laughter and joy with family and friends, great times of bewilderment and wonder, God, as they open their presents, great, great moments of, of sharing the affection they have for one another. But, God, more importantly, I pray for moments where they stop, they reflect, and they remember, Emmanuel, God is with us. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen.